Well, welcome to the first edition of Counterpoints in 2023. We're happy to see everybody today. Ryan, how you doing? Good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everybody out there. So Ryan is rocking the Andrew Ross Sorkin That's look right. today. <laughs> He's totally, if you're watching this, you'll see it's tropical. I think what happened is Sagar went to Tulum, and we decided yeah. to set the temperature here to Tulum yeah. levels. It's also, so that's what we're doing. It's also climate change. It's like <laughs> 65 degrees or so in Washington, D.C., and so the buildings just don't know how to deal with it. They have four seasons that they're prepared for. When winter comes and the climate wants to give you spring or fall, they just blast the heat anyway. And the funny thing is Ryan called ahead and said, I'm wearing a wool jacket today. Please set the studio <laughs> Wait, to set, a preferred temperature. Set it, set it super high. <laughs> yeah. no, nobody listen. Um, no, uh, actually, it was really hot in here. Yeah. It still is really hot in here. That said, Ryan actually has been, Ryan has reason whether or not it's hot in the studio. You have reason to be uh, sort of gruff and like an ink-stained wretch today because you were all over Capitol Hill oh, yesterday. Right. Well, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and so late, later in the show, we're going to talk to Matt, Matt Taibbi. We'll, we've got a lot to get into. But the drama, of course, was on Capitol Hill. Yes. And yeah, so I was in the, I was in the House press gallery for that, watching it unfold, which there was almost more drama in the kind of buildup than in the actual unfolding of it because nothing changed except for one vote. So, <laughs> to, so to back it up, Kevin, Kevin McCarthy uh, has been eyeing the speakership since, probably since he was four or five years old. Yes. Like never didn't want to be president, just wanted to be Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. And so the, the man gets in position and there are now this, there's this rump group of uh, right-wing Republicans who are running a kind of never Kevin type of campaign. His campaign is called Only Kevin. He has given up. It's uh, middle school, basically. Basically, yes. Because he's given up no so many, he's given up so many different concessions to them that it seems like the only thing left that he could give would be himself. Like they just don't want him yeah. at this point. Yeah. They don't trust him. The, the problem, so they had three votes yesterday. Uh, the, the, he won 203 votes the first time, which is 15 short of, of the 218 he needed. Second time he won 203 again. The third time he won 202. So now he has 20 uh, opponents. Uh, so at, at this point, it's very hard to see what his path is to the speakership. Yet at the same time, the opponents don't have a path yeah. to victory either. So they're just kind of staring at each other. They adjourned. They didn't have to adjourn, but... Democrats agreed to adjourn last night, and and all the parties agreed to, to adjourn. So now they're going to do it again today, still with no path forward. You were talking about how kind of Tucker Carlson, who if if anybody's going to mediate this, maybe be Tucker Carlson, <laughs> uh, threw out some ideas. What was his? Well, what, what was his take on, on what McCarthy's path is? Right. So Tucker obviously comes on at night after all of these negotiations had failed, basically, and said, uh, all right, how about this? Kevin McCarthy agrees to release all files related to January 6th and agrees to put Thomas Massey in charge of this church-like committee into the intelligence community that Kevin McCarthy has promised to convene. Um, personally, I'm, I'm fine with both of those points. There's a question, though, as to whether, uh, and, and you probably have a chance to chat with some folks on the Hill yesterday, that's enough to say, to your point, they're already saying, we don't trust Kevin McCarthy. The problem is not, you know, so, mm -hmm. so it's like, how much more stuff can we get from him? Because he made a concession on one of the biggest possible things that he could concede on, which is called the motion to vacate. It sounds like a dumb procedural beltway thing. And it is, but it's hugely consequential because it's what ousted John Boehner. It's what Mark Meadows used to force John Boehner out of leadership years ago. Nancy Pelosi, the shrewd tactician that she is, right. immediately was like, hell no to this, right. got rid of it. They wanted to bring it back. Kevin McCarthy agreed to bring it back, meaning five members of his caucus could basically at any time be like, Right. by and, and stage a coup, which is a really a huge concession from him. Um, they've also, from the perspective of the establishment Republicans, that was just a massive concession. Um, he's agreed to impeaching, uh, uh, having impeachment hearing for Alejandro Mayorkas. One thing he told me he wouldn't do in September, he then, by the time December rolled around, was like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, he's given uh, them a right. lot and, right. and they have a lot to be happy with. They should really be taking the W, but because it's more about personality than policy in this case, they think personality is policy, uh, because it's more about that, nothing is going to satisfy it. So does the Tucker point satisfy right. it? I don't know. Right now, with Tucker saying it rather than McCarthy saying it, maybe that makes it a little bit easier for them. Let's Can we put up A5, actually? Uh, this, this has uh, Kevin McCarthy basically saying that 
he's he's talking about Matt Gates here, yeah, uh, and Matt Gates and others that they basically made the same attempted to make the same deal that Tucker is suggesting. So let's roll a five here. Last night I was presented the only way to have 218 votes. If I provided certain members with certain positions, certain gavels, to take over the church committee, to have certain budgets. And they even came to the position where one, Matt Gates said, I don't care if we go to plurality and we elect Hakeem Jeffries and it hurts the new frontline members not to get reelected. So first of all, he's talking about the church committee there, which yeah. is this, this subcommittee that would have investing powers, basically a deep state committee. Now the, chur yes. the church committee is a, is a reference to uh, Senator uh, Frank Church back in the 70s who, who exposed all sorts of malfeasance on the part of the deep state, if you want to call them that at the time. I don't know if that term was much in circulation at the time, <laughs> uh, but he, he exposed all, all sorts of different crimes that the uh, CIA, FBI, other, other, el other elements of the kind of government apparatus had been committing, you know, post-World War II up, up through then. And so there's been this, pre this, and it's in the rules. Like if you, if you read the rules package, there is a committee in there for that type of oversight. Look, it sounds like uh, they, they were making a demand for who would run it. Tucker wants Thomas Massey yep. to run it, right? Yeah, he wants Thomas yeah. Massey. And Thomas Massey is a like super interesting maverick liber libertarian. Um, Be great for journalism. It would be if fantastic was, if for he was running that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm all for it. And you know what? They need somebody who's going to basically take no prisoners, and that would be a, the the person that you would think of would be a Thomas Bassey, somebody who doesn't care whether he's voting with the party line or not. Uh, so I think Tucker's suggestion is not a bad one. Um, but again, the question is, does that move votes when with a Matt Gates, for instance, like? Here is your sense that what they're doing right now is is trying to take this as far as they possibly can to the point where they have squeezed every last concession out of Kevin McCarthy that they possibly can, and then they'll say, okay, or is it just, we don't care, blow it all up. If Hakeem Jeffries get it, gets in, Hakeem Jeffries gets in, or here's the third option, it's a combination of everything and nobody really knows what the plan is. I think it's I think it's the latter. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I don't think that they have thought like I don't think they have a one, two, three, four, five, here's how we get to exactly where we are. I think it's more of a kind of Trump style approach to it, that we're just going to live to fight another day. Well, we're and not if it gets, going to give in to something we don't want, and then we're going to keep pushing. And if it gets blown up, who cares? And then if it gets blown up, who cares? What, do you, what did you think? Uh, do you believe that Gates did tell him that uh, he's okay with uh, Hakeem Jeffries taking over? First of all, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like, it's basically impossible for mm -hmm. that to happen. Right. It'd be hilarious if this is uh, if this clip is being played in a couple of weeks when they keep Jeffries as speaker, it's, it's virtually impossible yeah. uh, for it to happen. I could see Gates saying it as a bluff, like mm -hmm. to, to demonstrate to him how little he cares yeah. about whether or not McCarthy survives or not. A hundred percent. And I've said a couple of times on our podcast, Federalist Radio Hour, and maybe he was listening, uh, that all Republicans should just like cast, if you really want to do a protest vote, you should just get as many Republicans as possible to vote for Ilhan Omar and just stick it to Dem leadership, re Republican leadership at the same time in such a narrowly divided House of Representatives and just say, screw it. If Speaker you're, Omar? Yes, if all you're right. really trying to blow it all up, then do it then do it. But at this point, it's such a muddled strategy. They've gotten so much. They really have gotten so much out of Kevin McCarthy. Kevin McCarthy uh, sort of sees himself as someone who stuck his neck out for Jim Jordan, put him on oversight when a lot of establishment Republicans didn't. He's friendly with Marjorie mm -hmm. Taylor Greene, which is in D.C., Republican circles, unheard of that you would have an establishment, a denizen of the sort of Washington establishment, also be on personally friendly terms with a, like, person of the, the sort of positioning in the party that Marjorie Taylor Greene holds. Um, and I think he was really more confident because of that. I don't think he was ever perfectly confident. Mm -hmm. um, but because it was always like this, it was always, what are they going to do? Uh, they're going to throw bombs. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. But they really have a, they have a W to take. The W is on the table. Um, it's and, there. And if we, can put up, if we can put up A2, I'm curious for your take on tr Trump's role in this entire thing. So somebody called up Donald Trump yesterday and asked him, hey, are you sticking by your endorsement of your Kevin? Mm -hmm. That's my, one of his your best Kevin. nicknames, my Kevin. Uh, and Trump, uh, who is anything if, if not the least loyal person on the planet, <laughs> said, you know what, let's see. What do you say? Let's see how it goes. We'll see what happens. We'll see how it all works out. Yeah. Uh, so 
does Trump have a role in all of this? It sounds like, according to him, he's got some of these renegades calling him, maybe some of the others calling him, maybe Mike Kevin is calling him. Mm -hmm. uh, can, or does he just not have enough juice left to uh, move the needle inside the Republican conference? I don't think he's moving the needle inside the Republican conference, which is very interesting, actually, to watch, <laughs> because that was the expectation, is that Donald Trump would be sort of the kingmaker. Um, but he's really been on the sideline of this particular battle. If he had, again, positioned himself differently, if he weren't, for instance, attacking pro-life voters on True Social this week, it may be <sighs> easier right. for him to, like, actually have a, a say right now, but um, I think they're doing most of this of their own accord, and that's what's particularly interesting. Now, Kevin McCarthy, something interesting about him is if you contrast his relationship with Trump with Paul Ryan's relationship with Trump. Um, it's a it's totally a study in contrast, and like he learned from Paul Ryan, that's something I talked to him about. It, he learned from those kind of mistakes. He let Paul Ryan go before him, take the arrows, and then sort of realized that maybe there mm -hmm. was a different way to do this, um, and that's one of the big differences between the two of them. It's one of the things that helped him build relationships with people like, say, Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> um, and so he's been shrewd about it, but after January 6th, their split, you know, seemed to be not great. And I, I want to get to the, the the intrigue with Matt Gates and AOC on the floor in a second, but I'm curious Absolutely. for your take on this split between Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, because Greene has been kind of pro-McCarthy for a while. I mean, yes. In December, she was tweeting like, look, McCarthy has promised to impeach Biden if there's evidence to impeach him. And she, she listed all her reasons mm -hmm. uh, why you, they should work with the Kevin that they have rather than try to get a new Kevin. Uh, whereas Boebert, to, to, this, to this day, is still resisting him. What, you know, uh, are, are they are they anything of a squad? Have they ever been? What's what's their situation? How did they get to a place where they're kind of publicly attacking each other over this strategy? Yeah, I think this says way more about the Freedom Caucus than it does about Kevin McCarthy, um, because again, that's the Freedom Caucus has in the past been extremely successful because they have been tightly knit. They've been able to sort of rally around the cause of opposition to leadership, opposition to the establishment, which is a really strong unifier. That's something that the squad has kind of grappled with as well. There are always interesting parallels between the Freedom Caucus and the squad. But the fact that they're on a different page about something like this, um, I think is it's not, it shows that this is not a clean litmus test. You know, if you vote for Kevin McCarthy here, it doesn't mean you are, as Republicans might say, a squish or not. Mm -hmm. It's not that clean litmus test, even though some people are trying to make it into one, because um, for people like Lauren Boebert, I think she sees her cost-benefit analysis. She's saying, I can get, first of all, a lot of attention, a lot of publicity, and sort of be seen as a star in the same way that Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan became stars in the fight against John Boehner. I think she sees this mm -hmm. moment as that. And Marjorie Taylor Greene sees this moment as saying, well, I can consolidate support. I can you know, really build on my support with McCarthy, my relationship with McCarthy. I can win a lot of points right here for future negotiations and policymaking down the line and maybe get more Ws out of it from that sense. So those are, I think it's just two sides of that coin. And you've seen members taking swipes at Lauren Boebert saying, you know, when, when you can win a deep red district by more than like 50 votes, yeah. then you can come here and dictate <laughs> to us, you know, how we, how we ought to run things. But until then, uh, no thanks. And so the, the intrigue that did break through that we did learn about uh, was between uh, Matt Gates and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, if we, if we can play that video here. So basically, Matt Gates literally crossed the aisle, goes over, talks to AOC, because apparently he believes, actually, that AOC runs a Democratic Party. <laughs> like he, that's not just something like he hears on Fox and that he says. He maybe actually believes it to be true. And I, I love that in him. Like it's there's some hope there. <laughs> That's actually true. Uh, but so he, he walks over. There's a lot of speculation about what they said. Oh, I reported in The Intercept, we could put that up here, that basically what Matt Gates was saying was that, hey, Kevin McCarthy has been, he's been making a bunch of threats against us, and he has been telling us that he believes he's going to be able to get a deal with Democrats, that, a lot, that enough Democrats are going to vote present that it's going to allow him to win with his 202 or 203 or 25, 205 or even two, 210 votes. And so therefore, all of you people who are fighting me are out on a limb here mm. and you're, you're gonna get annihilated you know, once Democrats start to fold and, and kind of bail me out of this jam. Then AOC tells him, I don't think that that's the case. Right. Then she goes back to party leadership and I think you can see it at the end, 
saying, I'll get back to you or something like that. So she goes back to party labor. She, she's like, look, there's, there's no bailing out of Kevin McCarthy here, is there? Because McCarthy's telling his members that Democrats are going to bail him out. And the party leadership tells AOC, no, no absolutely not. <laughs> like, he's on his own. Nobody here is voting present. Nobody here is leaving. Like, that was another wishful thinking thing that started right. circulating kind of from the McCarthy camp that Democrats were just going to get bored and leave. Right, which like, lowers the threshold. Which, which then would lower the threshold, which, which to me suggests that they're out of plays. Like, if they're just hoping that Democrats are going to get bored, like, that's not how legislating tends to work. But although we're in uncharted territory, who knows? So what did, what did you make of, of Gates kind of using AOC to get intel from Democrats. Well, it was a great report because everybody on Twitter, I mean, this was so many people on Twitter were speculating what happened, what happened, wondering what happened. And Ryan's like, oh, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Gates, I asked her. She's the only one that responded. Yeah, yeah. no, it was, it was really interesting. And so I think that's also to the point about them being out of plays. There's reporting suggesting right now that's the play for today. That's one of the plays that Kevin McCarthy is perhaps banking just, on just, today. Just run out the clock. Get, like. Getting Democrats to vote present, which lowers the threshold so that he doesn't need the 218, that you can bring right. it down. And that there's precedent for that. I mean, what, didn't Nancy Pelosi win with 216? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's not as though that's a crazy idea. Um, and maybe if you're a certain type of Democrat, there's logic to be had in manipulating uh, and maybe taking He'd have some... to give. What would he give? Debt ceiling? I mean, what would Dem like the there's only... a lot he could give, um, but it hasn't really been on the table so far. So I don't know exactly what it is. But it, it, like debt ceiling is a great example. There could be something like that. There could be committee stuff. Um, there's, there's all kinds of stuff but, potentially but out there. But then it screws up his calculus for, because he can't give away something that he gave to a Republican in order to win their vote. Yeah, exactly. So, so good luck. Yeah. Good, good luck. Oh boy, we'll uh, be watching this all day. Yeah, it's a pickle. I mean, quite like it is, it is actually a pickle. You've got a runner between <laughs> second and yes. third and the ball is going back and forth. Uh, so we'll be paying attention. Ryan, you heading back to the hill today? Yes, Yeah. yeah wouldn't miss it. Jacket? Oh yeah, you can't, you actually can't be there without a jacket. That's right. Yeah. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now, and Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us, and if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.